Well, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Niels Broekhoff. Uh, thank you for joining us in our The Ocean Cleanup press briefing. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the press who have uh, taken the uh, opportunity to join us in our uh, headquarters here in Rotterdam. Uh, secondly, I would like to thank those journalists who have joined us via Skype. Most of you have, I believe. And then, of course, not least, I would like to thank the fans and followers of The Ocean Cleanup who have joined us via the various channels of the ocean cleanup. Uh, the press briefing will consist of two parts. The first one is a briefing of about 20 minutes, after which we will have a Q&A session of another 15 minutes. Um, and what I would like to ask you that during the briefing, if you have any question, just send them to us immediately so we can stream them live during the Q&A session. So when you have questions, just pop them in the, uh, the chat box of the social media channel or on Skype and we'll try to uh, take care of them during the Q&A session as much as possible. Next to me is Boyan Slot. He's the CEO and founder of The Ocean Cleanup. Next to him is Reiner De Feiter. He's hydrodynamics engineer, so the technical guy. And then we have Lonneke Holierhoek. She's the chief operations officer. So thank you, three of you. And um, Boyan, let's start off with you. All right. Um, so thank you all for joining us. Uh, today we'll be giving you an update on the latest status of our campaign in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So as most of you will know, at the Ocean Cleanup, our mission is to rid the world's oceans of plastic. And in this, our first priority is to tackle the largest accumulation zone of trash in the world, uh, the so-called Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which is situated halfway between Hawaii and California. Exactly seven years ago, uh, when I was aged 18, I stood on a stage for the first time in my life. And there, at my university, I shared my dream on how to rid the world's oceans of plastic. The idea was simple. Uh, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is vast, the plastic is really dispersed, and vessels are really expensive. So if you were to simply throw for plastic, it would take uh, untold amount of time and it would just be really, really expensive. But I asked the audience rhetorically, why would you go after the plastic if the plastic can also come to you? So I presented a passive concept that uses the natural forces of the ocean to catch the plastic. And while the idea was simple, the execution turned out to be anything but. And this wasn't helped by the fact that the idea was instantly dismissed, even ridiculed by some, and when people told us that it was really a fool's errand that was never going to work. Fortunately, though, there were some people that were actually willing to help me and see whether we could give it a try. So for the past five years, we conducted expeditions to understand the problem. We conducted various experiments. To, um, uh, to test the technology, all the while we iterated uh, the design quite a few times. But as something like this has never been done before, uh, the, the path of progress wasn't exactly a straight line. And we began to refer to these issues that we had along the way as, as unscheduled learning opportunities, and we had quite a few of those. Last September, we launched our first cleanup system from San Francisco towards the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, and literally one month later, we discovered that there wasn't a consistent speed difference between the system and the plastic, causing the system to actually not collect any plastics. And days before the end of the year, the system suffered from a fatigue fracture, causing an 18-meter end section to completely disconnect from the rest of the system forcing us to tow the system back to, to port. So we regrouped, we analyzed the root causes, and we relaunched in, in really in, in record time with system 1B in June. There, we, uh, with it, we, we tested multiple configurations uh, and found one that actually resulted in a consistent speed difference between the system and the plastic by using a parachute anchor slowing down the system. Yet, of course, a new unscheduled learning opportunity was discovered. 
The plastic was now overtopping the cork line of the screen, causing the plastic to, not, to still not be caught by the system and to be able to simply pass through the system, still uh, causing the system to not collect any plastics. But today, I am very proud to share with you that we're now catching plastics. Nice. Yes. Yeah. Uh, our, there's our only two fans <laughs> in, in the room. That's great. Um, so uh, by upgrading the system with a new, much higher cork line, we've been able to nearly eliminate the overtopping issue, which means that we now have a self-contained system in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch that is using the natural forces of the ocean to passively catch and concentrate plastics, thereby confirming the most important principle behind the ocean cleanup system. And not only that, but we've been able to do so for plastics of all size classes, from giant ghost nets all the way to really microscopically sized microplastics. And, uh, well, let's have a look at some footage uh, to see how that looks like. So, here's some footage of the situation, how things looked like back in uh, July, August, where we saw, yes, plastic is entering the system, yet it's overtopping the screen over here, ending up in this zone, which we refer to as the twilight zone. You don't want to be in the twilight zone. It's not a safe place to retain plastics. So, we, um, we took that screen out. The nice thing is that the system is really built in a modular fashion, so we can easily adjust things, and um, put in a new, uh, a new cork line, which is actually much bigger. So we went from a 15, meter, or a 15 centimeter freeboard to a 50 centimeter freeboard, which you see right here. And, um, and this is footage from last week. And uh, here we have, say, two, three meter waves, uh, sea state four to five. Uh, it was really a windy week. And you can just see that how nicely this cork line is now able to follow the water with the plastic staying on the correct side of the screen. So that's, um, that's really important. Now, um, in terms of the plastic that has been collected with the system, now here you see uh, one of the ghost nets that uh, is being retrieved from the cleanup system. So, uh, so that's towards the larger um, side of the, uh, the plastic collected. And of course, then you have all the intermediate stuff, the, the helmets, the office chairs, etc. And then this is all the sub-centimeter pieces, so most of this is microplastics, all collected by, um, by the cleanup system. And then this is the situation right now, where you indeed see the mix of you know, really relatively slow-moving, large objects like these, uh, these ghost nets, and relatively fast-moving small pieces, like these, these microplastics. And, you know, car tire, no idea how that ended up there, but if you're missing a wheel, just let us know. Um, so yeah, so that's the, the, the current situation. So looking at these, uh, these conclusions of the System 1 campaign, uh, this now gives us uh, sufficient confidence in the general concept to keep going on this path and to now initiate the System 2 project. But uh, if the journey to this point taught us anything, it is that it's definitely not going to be easy. And it's important to stress that there's still quite a few hurdles ahead of us before we are actually ready to scale. So two topics uh, in particular are important to address before we uh, do the scale-up. And one is long-term durability. So while the current system has been doing fine, it's... Um, yeah, it, it's simply not designed to be uh, out there for, for many years, which, which is, of course, what we eventually need to do. And secondly, the second point is, uh, is long-term durability. So, uh, sorry, it's, it's long-term retention. So the, um, while the current system is able to hold on to the plastic for, for days, maybe weeks, we eventually have to go to months or even more than a year uh, for, for the economics to, to work. So... Simply summarized, there's, there's a lot of work still ahead of us. But for now, I would just like to say that I'm extremely proud of the team and all our supporters for, for making an impossible dream possible and for sticking at, it, uh, sticking at it for all these years. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Boya. Very clear. Thanks a lot. So, so Reinder, can you explain to the audience how you came to this point from a technical point of view? Yes, for sure. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so first of all, it's, it's great to see that last summer we confirmed this foundation of our, of our cleanup technology. Uh, as Neil said, my name is Reiner de Feiter. I joined the Ocean Cleanup in 2016 as a hydrodynamic engineer. And since then, I've been offshore a couple of times. Last time was with the System 1B campaign, uh, out of which you can see the, the results behind me. Um, and when I was there, and when I, I, I felt, I saw, I, I even smelled the plastic, I knew that we were closer than ever to, uh, to, to a cleanup solution. And um, that's because we observed three things. First of all, we saw that we were able to generate a, a speed difference with the plastic. Secondly, we managed to, after generating the speed difference, catch the plastic. And thirdly, we saw that we catched all of the size classes of plastic, not just one, but we captured the whole range. Going back to the speed difference, uh, like Boyan said, our first system, System Wilson, that we deployed in 2018, we saw that we had a problem with the speed difference. The plastic and the system both moved through the ocean at more or less the same speed. Now, by making some iterations and by deploying a para-anchor, we are able to generate a speed difference between the plastic and the system, letting the plastic drift into the system passively. Secondly, once it's in the system, we were able to, after some iterations, come up with a screen design that holds onto the plastic, that captures the plastic. And that really took some effort. Uh, as some of you might know, our first screen designs failed. We had problems with structural failure. Uh, after that, we had problems with, like Boyan said, overtopping. But as for now, we're very pleased to say that we solved those issues and we now have a screen that captures the plastic. And finally, like you see here behind me, we've been able to do so for nets, ghost nets, but also for small particles. And this really is a major milestone because it might sound trivial, but plastic may look the same, it may feel the same, it might even smell the same, but it doesn't behave the same in the ocean. If you have a big ghost net of, of one ton, it, it moves completely different through the ocean than small plastics in the millimeter scale. And that really took some, some fundamental research into how these plastics behave and, and generating computer models to predict that. Um, but as for now, we think it's a, it's a big success that we see in real life in the ocean that we capture the full range of plastics. And combining all of these three points, we're very confident and we're pleased to say that we now use the natural ocean forces to capture plastic. Um, it's not uh, just a small thing. No, this thing is, is ocean powered. It does it all by itself. Um, and that's from an engineering point, uh, a big success. And we're very confident moving forward towards uh, a full fleet of cleanup systems, hopefully as soon as possible. Reinder, thanks a lot for explaining. Great, great to hear. So, so Lonneke, uh, can you explain the process and impact of the ocean cleanups operations up till now? Yes, thank you, Niels. Uh, we started mission one a year ago. After some initial nearshore trials, system one, or Wilson, as it was known as, uh, was deployed in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And we ensured continuous monitoring, so we were always close by, which uh, meant that we learned very fast from the problems that we were observing that we had more work to do. After that setback, the system broke, so that really put our resolve to the test. We studied what we needed to do, and we decided we wanted to test some variations to our design concept. And by focusing on specific and limited test objectives and applying the art of emission, we managed to get back offshore in a record time of only six months. System 1B was deployed in the patch on the 26th of June. Uh, we had scheduled an initial sequence of testing for about two months. Uh, after the results that were very encouraging, we decided we wanted to extend this period 
which gave us a bit more time to implement some of the design improvements that uh, Reiner and Boyan explained uh, resulted in the good news that we are here sharing with you today. System 1B is now operational offshore for three months. We hope to extend this operation until the end of November, which will allow us to gather even more information so that we're in an even better position to start the next phase. But because we have, we consider we fulfilled the key objectives of this test campaign, we now will proceed with even more experimental tests that may possibly put the design criteria uh, out of its uh, boundaries, pushing the boundaries of the design criteria. We intend to conclude mission one in December, 15 months after we started it. With the lessons we learned so far, uh, we've already started uh, the next phase. And the next phase is the development of system two, a new system with improved performance and an extended design life. This design process will require more testing, possibly on component level or possibly applying the modular principles that we've done for system 1B. Because the quick relaunch success from system 1B has taught us that learning by doing is something that we want to apply as much as possible. We are really proud of our achievements so far and very pleased with the positive results. Besides that, as an organization, we're very grateful to the team, the team members, who went offshore for long periods of time, very far away from the comforts of home and office. We do know and, and, and expect more challenges, more, un more unexpected learning uh, uh, experiences and more surprises. But our team has proven to be steadfast and resilient, so we are full of confidence for the future. But I would like to end, because we can't do it alone, I would like to end with a special thanks to our long-term partners, specifically the Dutch government and Maersk, because they continue to play a vital role in our project. So, thank you, Lonneke. So this is uh, the first part. So this is the, the press briefing, and we've already received some questions uh, via social media. And, and please feel free to send us more questions as we go. So uh, do feel invited. The first question that we received uh, via Facebook is, uh, I think, uh, directed to you, Bojan. So do you have enough funding to continue the project? Sure. Um, so um, obviously there will come a time when um, we have to scale and uh, more resources are needed. Uh, however, uh, with, the current, um, with the current position and thanks to the support of, of really you know, uh, quite a large number of people in, uh, in the past year, uh, we're still, in a, I think, in a comfortable position um, where we feel comfortable to actually start the, the System 2 uh, development now. So, uh, so right now, it's, uh, I think we're in a good position. Of course, once we have to scale, uh, we're going to need, obviously, a lot more support. Right. Another uh, question that came to us uh, through Facebook, um, which was, so when will you bring the first pl plastic back to shore? Sure. What's your expectation? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we end mission one um, uh, yeah, in early December uh, of this year, and that means that at that time we will uh, uh, bring everything to shore that we have used uh, offshore, including the, the plastic. So that will come uh, towards the end of this year. End of this year. And so another question that popped up was, so, so when it, it, it is on shore, so what happens with the plastic? Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so... Uh, obviously, the plan is to to recycle the plastics. Uh, we, um, yeah, I think we have quite some really cool ideas for what to do with the plastic. Uh, fortunately, I think it's a bit too early to to share them yet. But uh, I think once we take the first plastic back to shore, um, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll share the first details on what's going to happen with the plastics. So. All right, exciting. Um, uh, another question through Facebook: uh, When will the second system be ready? Any timelines? Yeah, it's a little bit early to uh, attach a, a timeline on, on that uh, yet because we've only started. So we do need to assess uh, the actual scope that we still need to address. We know what we need to focus on, uh, extend the design life and improve the overall performance. 
um, to make the economics work as well for the future scale up. Uh, so as soon as we have a more fixed timeline, we will uh, uh, yeah share that with uh, everybody. All right, but um, yeah, as soon as possible for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll do everything possible to get the next one out there as soon as possible. Okay. And another interesting question on Facebook. So, are you dedicating any work to preventing plastics from entering the ocean? Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, that, that's I think an interesting question, uh, but uh, but not for today. Yeah. Not for today. <laughs> as well. uh, another question just just popped in. So, how does the salt water influence the quality of the plastic or for recycling? <laughs> that's good. So, um, so definitely there there's um, uh, there's there's multiple mechanisms that are degrading the plastic. It's the salt water. It's the wave action. Uh, the, the, the primary one is actually a photo degradation, so UV radiation, um, yeah, oxidizing. So with the combined with the with the air, um, so with oxygen, uh, really attacking the polymer chains, breaking them down, making the material more brittle over time. And then of course also the plastic additives, the plasticizers that can leach out of the material, uh, all contributing to the degradation of the material. Um, but yeah, I suppose. I mean, it's it's a good thing and a bad thing, I suppose. But um, uh, but the, the the fact is that this degradation process is extremely slow. I mean, it's it, it's supposed to be faster just on land. And if you think about your plastic garden chair, I mean, it doesn't fragment down in you know in, in a very short amount of time. So uh, so that's why we see plastic uh, in the garbage patch. That's really old. We. Actually, during this campaign, we, we recovered the oldest piece that was still in recognizable shape uh, that we ever recovered from uh, 1970, uh, some, some crate. And um, yeah, so de degradation is, is a really slow process, which is, of course, bad because um, yeah, that's why these garbage patches are there. Um, but on the other hand, for recycling, I suppose it's, um, it's, uh, it's a good thing. Another question that we received is, you know, as we're dealing with a global challenge, are you sharing any of this technology with other countries? Yeah. Um, so, obviously, our our mission is to rid the oceans of plastic. It's a, we're a nonprofit. So, if every, anyone else, um, yeah, <laughs> is in the position to also remove plastic from the ocean, that's only great. So, um, so obviously, we welcome anyone, you know. Be it countries, companies, nonprofits, individuals, whatever, um, to uh, to join this mission. Um, yeah, of course, our our goal is to help ourselves out of business, and the more plastic other people get out of the ocean, um, the less work it is for the ocean cleanup. Okay. Um, the question about the pictures you've shown and um, the volume you captured seems small. Um, can you scale this large enough for the entire ocean? Sure. Um, yeah. So I'll probably say a bit about that, and maybe Ryan, you can add. But um, so, so this is um, what's important to stress with this um, this image right here is that um, the, uh, this is actually um, roughly ten thousand times more concentrated than uh, than sort of background density of plastic. So, um, so even though you know it, it it seems like a small amount, it's actually you know highly highly concentrated because the plastic is super dispersed. Um, so, um, so the uh, and and the second thing that's I think important to share is that last week, unfortunately, we were in an area where there was relatively uh, low concentration of plastic. Uh, we're kind of at the periphery of the garbage patch. Um, so um, yeah, so therefore the catch so far. Um, so this is literally a few days. Is um, you know is is quite uh, you know, relatively small compared to what's out there. Um, of course, the plan is eventually to harvest uh, you know, up to 15,000 tons of plastic uh, per year, um, for which we would need a whole fleet of systems, um, and those systems would have to be bigger as well. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, in principle, if you do the math, um, with enough time and enough systems, um, you can do it. Question uh, on Facebook about microplastics. Uh, how you intend to tackle that, the microplastics? Yeah. Um, so, out in the field, we managed to capture plastics as small as one millimeter. Um, 
the official range for microplastics is smaller than five, so we are uh, quite quite far below that threshold, capture up to one millimeter. Uh, smaller than that, we haven't seen in, in, in the system, um, so that's something we don't catch, and that's something uh, which might require further research or uh, something, uh, something to see. For now, our focus is to get this stuff out of there. Yeah, it's um, maybe to add on that, uh, smaller than one millimeter comprises 0.7% of the amount of plastic in the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. So 99.3% of the plastic is, well, yeah, taking that one millimeter threshold is capturable with the current um, setup. So, and of course, I'm talking about mass percentage, right? So, um, so, yeah, so, of course, we want to get it down as small as possible. But I think one millimeter is already, you know, not That's too small. shabby. Yeah. No? Yeah. A question from the, 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 the press listening in. Uh, this is uh, Emily Baker from the Wall Street Journal. Um, the, the question is, is, how big a hole would the cleanup system need to collect for the mission to be economically feasible and successful? And have any ocean cleanup partners committed to utilize plastics collected by the ocean cleanup? Sure. Um, so the, um, the, the, we're talking about the economics. Um, what's, what's really important to understand is, is that vessels are really expensive. So um, if you think about the vessel that we have out there right now, I think it runs at around 15 to 20,000 euros per day. And that's not even a very big vessel. Um, and of course, we're, you know, we have some partnership benefits. So, um, so, so vessels are really, really expensive. And um, so, so if you were to just have to be next to it uh, all the time with a boat or you were to troll with a boat, uh, it would just be, yeah, it would just be burning a lot of money as well as fuel, which isn't really environmentally friendly. So, so the key to, to make the economics work is to have a system that can autonomously concentrate and you know, collect and concentrate the plastic uh, for long periods of time. Um, so, uh, and that's actually the jump that we want to make from system one to system two, is to upscale the system and uh, for it to, to really be able to stay out there for, um, yeah, for maybe even a year, so that uh, you only periodically have to go out there and harvest the plastic. Uh, as really the metric to optimize for is the number of vessel days or the, the vessel hours required per ton of plastic collection. Of course, right now that's really high, um, but um, yeah, by, by really making the system autonomous, um, that's, that should really come down. So it's not really the, the, the capex of, of the system, that, that's the problem, it's really the opex. And, um, yeah, and of course, how we design the system heavily influences your OPEX. So um, I hope that, that answers your, your question. And the utilization of the plastics yeah. that you're collecting, the second part? Yes. Um, so, uh, yeah, so again, I, I can't share too many details on that yet. Uh, we'll, we'll share those once the first plastic is on shore in December. Um, yet the, um, yeah, the, the, the plan is actually going to be to go all the way uh, to uh, the supporters, to uh, say the, the, the B2C, uh, because we think um, you know, the material value is actually really low. It's, and it's, of course, it's much more expensive to get plastic from the middle of the ocean than from the garbage bin in the street. Um, so we do need to utilize, sorry, you do need to utilize the, um, the, the story value and the fact that it's coming from the patch and the value that you can actually help clean the ocean by purchasing products made out of this, this material. Um, that, you know, that's really important to, to utilize. Um, so we will likely vertic uh, vertically integrate th that aspect, um, go really far into the, into the chain, um, uh, as, as we think that's where most value to the materials added. Right, thank you. I think this, this question is for you, Reine. Um, mm -hmm. Someone on YouTube, and we're also streaming to YouTube, asks, so how do you plan to completely solve the overtopping issue? Yes. Well, um, previously we saw overtopping problems. By installing this new cork line with this, this higher freeboard, like Boyan explained, uh, so far we have eliminated it. Um, that will require further testing to confirm that in, in harsher conditions. Um, 
as for now, hey, like you saw, it, 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 it isn't tested in winter months, so that's ongoing research. But for now, we're confident that we, uh, that we at least solved this, this problem so far. Then I have um, another question from uh, Chris Andrews, and he's a professional uh, from a professional engineering magazine, and I think it's a question for you, uh, Lonneke. Uh, so how do you ensure that marine animals don't get caught in the, in the floating structure? <laughs> Yeah, that's a very important question to ask because, of course, the reason why we're out there is we want to save marine life from getting harmed by this floating plastic out there. So all our design choices uh, are based on minimizing the risk of harming anybody. Um, and we have involved uh, various experts on uh, assessing the potential impact and we continuously monitor any interaction that we have with marine life there and so far we've actually uh, haven't seen any negative interaction there okay thank you so, so maybe to, to to add on that uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, likely uh, or, well, one of the reasons why that's likely happening is because the system is moving so slow you know, the average delta v uh, we're looking at roughly 10 centimeters per second ish yeah. that order of magnitude um, so that's the speed you mean? Yes, yeah. so the speed through, so actually that's the speed through the plastic, so the speed through water, maybe slightly higher, but, um, uh, you know, it, because it's so slow, um, yeah, it's not like a, you know, a fishing trawler, that's this, you know, they, they actually move at quite a speed, because, mm -hmm. you know, that's how you collect sea life, but, um, yeah, it's, it's very slow, it's kind of inert, you can't get entangled, so, um, so that's probably why it's been fine so far. Okay. Another question for you, Reinde. Uh, on Facebook, someone asked, so, so how will you move the plastic from the screen to the vessel? Yeah. As for now, that was not uh, our focus of this mission. Our focus of this mission was really to confirm these, these basic principles uh, behind our, our system, which we have been able to do. Um, so as for now, that was a simplified extraction method by hand. Um, and into the future, we will develop more advanced technologies to, to do that better during uh, more better conditions. Um, but as for now, it was just by hand with scoop nets. Okay. Um, one of the last questions um, on Facebook. Somebody asked, so can you make this break even? And if yes, when will, will you reach this point? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I think so. I mean, obviously that. You know that's how it, it, you know you, you, this thing can exist. We're we're a non-profit, so you know you can't just you know burn investors' money or something. Um, so um, yeah, so 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 the I think you know when we are ready to well, I think in a few years' time um, you know, when we actually have the full-scale fleet out there, I think it should be possible to with to cover the operational cost of the cleanup operation um, using uh, the plastic harvested. At least that's the that's the ambition. So, um, so of course we would need help with the you know the, the initial cost of getting the fleet out there, being ready to actually operate. Um, but I do think that we have a model um, that that could potentially cover the operational cost of, of the fleet. So, so the last question we're handling this morning is also on Facebook. So do you plan to run your cleanup systems fully autonomously? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, like Boyan said, uh, this cleanup is only feasible if they operate autonomously uh, to be able to cut down on those vessel costs. Okay. Seems like a clear answer to me. Thanks a lot. So these are the questions that you just sent us uh, via our social media channels or, or, or via Skype. Um, but do feel free to send them. If you have any further questions, send them to us. Use the email address press at theoceancleanup.com and we'll really try to answer them as quickly as possible. Um, also, by the time you have um, attended this meeting, you will have received a press kit. So you've received a press release plus uh, background information, also images and video. So uh, you'll be able to use it in your productions or stories uh, later on. Um, for now, I'd really like to thank uh, the three top people of the Ocean Cleanup uh, doing this and presenting this. I'd like you to, uh, uh, yeah, I'd like to thank you for attending the press briefing. If you have any questions, do mail them to us, like I said before. For now, thanks a lot and have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. Bye.